on the Lone Prairie. The first Europeans in the New World were surprised by America's forest, by their vastness and vigor, but they weren't surprised by forest. Europe was full of trees. It was when the people pushed west into the continent's heartland that they found something that was indeed a new world. America's savannas, its grasslands, seemed endless. They were like nothing any of them had seen before. The grass sometimes reached 12 feet, so that the tallest animals and men were hidden in the growth. But if you stood on a rise and looked over the grass, there was nothing to block your view. No mountains, no trees, nothing. Just an enormity of sky that stretched out in every direction and rubbed its belly on the grass. The unshorn fields, boundless and beautiful, for which the speech of England has no name. That was poet William Colin Bryant's explanation for that French word prairie. It means big meadow. There were savannas in Africa with lions and giraffes and rhinoceros, but the African grasslands were much smaller than the American prairie. Our prairie divided itself into three regions. The tall grass prairie began near Lake Michigan and Illinois and pushed west. Almost all of Iowa was filled with tall grass. The tall grasses thrived where there was plenty of rain. Sometimes those grasses, especially big blue stem, grew half an inch a day. Far to the west, in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, there were short grasses, just a few inches high. This was the Great Plains region. It was high, flat, dusty, dry grassland, a steppe, cold in winter and hot in summer. The grasses that grew best on the Great Plains, buffalo grass and blue grama, were drought tolerant. In between the tall and short were, as you might guess, mixed and medium grasses. Altogether, it was the greatest grassland on earth and home to wildflowers, birds, insects, and animals in astonishing balance and abundance. Before the railroads, the homesteaders, and the cattle ranchers pushed west, there were perhaps 60 million bison and 50 million pronghorn, along with millions of wolves, deer, elk, and coyotes, as well as grizzlies, bighorn sheep, cottontails, rattlesnakes, and perhaps 5 billion, yes billion, prairie dogs. Prairie dogs aren't dogs at all. They are burrowing members of the squirrel family, but there were more earthworms and butterflies than prairie dogs. And as for birds and ducks in the migration season, they sometimes filled the sky like a cloud, like a dark moving cloud that, right here we have a picture and it says, as many as 60 million bison grazed on the American prairie before homesteaders, cattle ranchers, and railroads pushed into the region. So before we move on to the next page, let me read this part again. And as for birds and ducks in migration season, they sometimes filled the sky like a dark moving cloud that blocked the sun from the earth and stretched as far as anyone could see. Prairie grass has thick roots that twist and tangle and intertwine with the earth. That root-hard soil made the sod that the settlers cut for their homes. At first, it broke the homesteaders' plows but steel plows mastered the sod. Prairie fires kept the grasslands treeless. The fires started naturally from sparks of lightning, and they spread like wildfires. The fires were useful. They cleared out the dead grasses and encouraged new shoots. But animals or people were sometimes faced with terrifying walls of flames higher than their heads. And up here I have a picture that goes with that. Wildfires, a natural occurrence on the dry prairie, posed a constant threat to farms and ranches. Domestic animals, cattle and sheep, and farmers who pulled up the grasses and planted food crops changed the prairie from grassland to market basket. The fertile land where grass grew so vigorously became the richest agricultural region in the world. The vast prairies turned into corn and wheat fields, or cities, or grazing lands, or sometimes forests, when fires were fought. Today, the produce of this region feeds our nation, and others too. 
That market basket reminds us the earth is a changing place. The cornfields are just the latest inhabitants of a region rich in environmental history. In the great sweep of time, the grasslands were newcomers. 100 million years ago, mid-America was a tropical jungle with lush forests and roaming dinosaurs. Then the climate changed. Dinosaurs disappeared to return on TV screens and grass took over. And what of that grassland? Where can you see prairie today? Real prairie, like Lewis and Clark saw. Hardly anywhere. Illinois, which once had 37 million acres of tall grass prairie and is known as the Prairie State, now has about 3,500 acres of it. There is some tall grass prairie at Kanza Preserve near Manhattan, Kansas, and the Nature Conservatory has a tall grass preserve in Oklahoma, 17 miles north of Palhuska. For midgrass, visit the Willa Cather Prairie near Red Cloud, Nebraska. You can see short grass prairie at Curando National Grassland in Kansas. You'll also find prairie at Blue Mounds State Park in Minnesota and Prairie Dog Town in Shirley Basin, Wyoming. To see the prairie, along with an awesome cave, visit Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. Down here we have a picture. A pioneer family harnesses the winds that sweep across the plains to power the pump for a deep well. So that was chapter one. I hope you all have a great day.